Now, before we get into the message, I'd just like to invite you to bow your heads so we can just uh, have a quick prayer. Kind of most gracious Lord, again, we're so thankful for this opportunity to worship in your house today. We just ask the presence of your holy angels to be here with us, and we most importantly ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that as the word is spoken, we will not harden our hearts, but that we'll receive it, O oh Lord. And we just ask that you uh, break up the, follow, the, the hardened ground of our hearts, O oh Lord, so that the word will, become, will be a seed that will be planted and that will bring forth fruit. Be with me as I speak thy word. May these words not be mine own, but may they, be, may they come down from, directly from your throne. For we ask it all in the mighty and holy and most precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so today uh, the sermon title is called The Healing Touch. And the story begins in Genesis with the story of creation. Uh, uh, a story or an account of creation that we're all very familiar with. So in, cre in, in Genesis, we see everything coming into existence through the spoken word of God. The heavens, the earth, the seas, and all the plant and animal life, as well as man whom God formed from the dust of the ground. And when he had completed creation, when he had completed creation, God declares in Genesis 1, verse 31, that God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Everything existed in perfect harmony because it was founded on one principle, and that was the principle of love. Let me explain that a little bit further by reading uh, something here in Steps to Christ, page 1. It says, nature and revelation alike testify of God's love, right? So his creation. Our Father in heaven is the source of life, of wisdom, of joy. Look at the wonderful and beautiful things of nature. Think of their marvelous adaptation to the needs of happiness, not only of man, but of all, of all living creatures. The sunshine, the rain that gladden and refresh the earth, the hills and the seas and the plains all speak to us of the Creator's love. It is God who supplies the daily needs of all his creatures. Now, one of the characteristics of love is selflessness, which is total conformity and total dependence on God and not on oneself. Let me explain that. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13 real quick. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And I will read verses four and five, right? Are you there? Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, and does not provoke and thinks no evil. So love does not seek its own. So it's based on the principle of selflessness. And such was the order of creation as it was fashioned by our creator, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice the contrast. We come to Genesis chapter 3 here. Turn to Genesis 3. We'll read 4 to 6. Genesis 3, 4 to 6. Are you all there? Okay, so here we see Satan, the fallen angel, introducing a new concept other than what God had ordained. Now, Genesis, uh, uh, what is it again? 3, 4 to 6. Okay. So it says, then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So in a nutshell, Satan rearranged God's formula. Instead of depending on God, instead of abiding by his principle of selflessness, he introduces this idea of depending on oneself. In other words, selfishness. You know, if you eat of this fruit, you, your eyes will be open. You will know the difference between good and evil. If you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. You, 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 you. And it's interesting to note that in the center of the word sin is the letter I, which is me, 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 me. And Eve, Eve fell for it, and as a result, sin came into the world. 
And so terrible was the, were the results of this dreadful disease of sin that it threatened the harmony of the universe, and it was extremely contagious that all mankind became infected by it. And the selfish, na selfish nature of the disease was immediately apparent because not only was mankind infected by sin, but even the air became polluted. The vegetation, the animal kingdom, they were not spared from the deadly effects of sin. Turn to Genesis 3, uh, 14. 14. It says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So as a result of sin, the animal kingdom became cursed. Because when you read that, it says you are cursed above all animals, all the beasts. So that means there must have been a curse to a certain degree that affected the rest of the animal kingdom, right? Now look at verse 17. It says, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree from which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Right? Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So because of sin, everything became affected. Now prior to sin, everything was in perfect harmony. The beasts of the field could live together in peace, the lion and the lamb. Not a single leaf would experience decay. In fact, we are told in inspiration that when Adam saw his first leaf as a result of sin fall to the ground, he wept bitterly because now he can start to see the effects, the results of what he had done. So when sin came into the picture, this idea of selfishness, it threatened the harmony of God's creation. You see, all life depends on God and in turn benefits one another, right? So for instance, you have trees, trees that need, uh, uh, they need water and light to produce oxygen, right? And oxygen benefits all life. And if we took care of trees the way that we should, maybe we'll have a more pure atmosphere. But in the name of selfishness, we're chopping them all down to build houses, to build that, and to build this, right? Likewise, plants depend on bees for cross uh, pollination, and et cetera, and et cetera. So life comes forth from God, and it depends, and it benefits one another. That was the order of creation. But sin operates on a different concept, which is destructive to all life. Self-service, self-dependence. I mean, look at the bodies of water, for instance. If you look at the, um, the brooks, right? The brooks flow into the streams. I'm not sure if that's the correct order, but it flows into the streams. It gives to the streams. The streams give to the rivers. The rivers give to the seas, right? That's why you can go drink water from a brook, because it's constantly being purified. It's taking in order to give, right? But then there's one that's called the Dead Sea. Right? It's known for just receiving, receiving, receiving. It doesn't give. So all the pollutants end up in the Dead Sea to the point that life in the Dead Sea is impossible. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Now this concept of sin has only one inevitable outcome, right? The principle that it's based on has only one inevitable outcome, and that's death, destruction, that's misery. So next time, you know, when we go and try and buy our iPhones and stuff like that, we should think about it. Because, you know, in, in certain countries, the poor countries, they're putting, uh, uh, you know, three and four year olds into forced labor in order to produce some of these things just so we can gratify ourselves, right? Now, because of all sin, because of this, sin is loathsome to God. Because of its nature, because of what it does, because of, of, of it's, it's like an infectious disease. So it's loathsome to God. Now there's a disease that is mentioned in the Bible that's comparable to sin, and that is the disease of leprosy. Leprosy is a contagious disease that affects the skin, the mucous membranes, and the, 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 the nerves causing discoloration and lumps of the skin and leads to disfigurement. It's a disease that basically eats you alive. Your flesh begins to rot from your bone and eventually it will lead to your death. Let me just read something for you from uh, The Cross in His Shadow, page 162. 
It says, of all the disease to which mankind is heir, there is none more loathsome than leprosy. The individual lives for years with this dread disease, slowly eating away portions of his body until he longs for death as a release. From the earliest times, leprosy has been a type of sin, and a very fitting type uh, is that of the loathsome spiritual disease which destroys the soul of the one who violates his conscience again and again until he has no power to resist and becomes wholly surrendered to evil. That is the disease of leprosy. Now in the Bible, in order to prevent an outbreak of this disease of leprosy, the leper was not allowed to mingle with people and there were no exceptions. So from the king to the highest of the highest of the politicians, the king, whoever it was, to the lowest, to the bond servant, to the slave girl, whoever became infected by this disease had to be excluded from the people. There were no exceptions. And this was done to prevent further outbreak. The disease was so contagious that the garments of the leper would be burned down and his house torn down to prevent further spreading of the disease. Anything the leper would touch would become contaminated. The air that he breathed became unclean, right? And he was to dwell alone as an outcast. Matter of fact, turn to Leviticus 13 real quick. Leviticus 13, uh, verses 45 to 46. If you're there, just say amen. Okay, now it says, Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean all the days that he has the sore. He shall be unclean. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside of the camp. So, so terrible and dreadful was this disease that uh, alone in his camp, if he heard the appro uh, uh, people approaching, he would declare unclean, unclean, so they would not come close because there's a risk that they might also uh, 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 be infected by this disease. And such is sin. Sin is contagious. And not only does the sin affect the sinner, but it also affects others. It affects the environment, it affects the air that we breathe, as well as God's creation directly or indirectly. You see, we always have this notion that whenever we commit an act of sin, it's limited to what we are doing, it's limited to just me. But sin doesn't stop there, right? Sin affects others, it affects the environment. So any act of sin that we commit is bound to affect others. It's gonna affect the environment, God's creation. That's the nature of sin. Consider Adam. Right? One little sin, he was told not to partake of the forbidden fruit, but he ate of it. And we see the results of sin today. All you have to do is just, what, walk outside your house. You'll see the effects and the results of sin all over us. So just because of that one sin. So sin is not limited to us or to what we do, but it also affects others. So anytime you commit an act of sin, it's going to harm others. I mean, consider people that smoke. Right? Look at secondhand smoke, what it does. There are people who are dying with emphysema who've never touched a cigarette in their life, but because someone else is smoking, the air becomes polluted, and when we breathe in that air, then they contract that disease, right? Look at those that are like trophy hunters. They go hunting animals for no reason. In fact, I was looking at something on the news. Uh, there was uproar about the lady that killed, uh, you know, uh, was it a lady or a man that killed a lion in Africa or something like that? Just so he can have a trophy to say, I have killed uh, uh, an animal. Just so for self-gratification, an animal has to pay the price for no reason. That is the result of sin. And whether we like it or not, and whether we believe it or not, we have all be in, been infected by this dreadful disease called sin. Turn to Romans 3.23. Romans 3, 23. Are you there? It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Does it say some? It says all. So we have all been infected by this dreadful disease. We are all lepers whether we know it or not. And one thing about the leprosy disease is that it eats the nerves so that that way you get to a point where you don't feel pain anymore. The leper can actually catch fire and won't even know that they're on fire because their nerves are all dead. They've all been eaten, they've all rotted away. And sometimes some of us are so deeply infected by this sin, we don't even know it. We're on a path to perdition, we don't even realize it. That's the nature of sin. 
But thankfully, God had a plan to save us from this disease. The good news is that the disease has a cure. What do you say, church? Amen. There's a cure. God had an elaborate plan because his love for mankind and his creation is unquestionable, right? You know what they say, that the closest thing to, to, to God's love for mankind is a mother's love for her children. I was reading a story about this lady. Her name was uh, Mindy, is Mindy Tran. Uh, she was parked on a little bit of a slope and she forgot to put the car in, in the gear in park. So the car started to roll back and she had twins in the back, right? And the car started to roll back onto oncom oncoming traffic and she was screaming frantically to try and get help so people can come and try and help uh, 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 slow down, stop the car. But because it was on a slope, it was accelerating downhill. And what did she do? In order for her to break the momentum, she directly threw herself under the tire of the moving car so that when the car hits her, it kind of slows down the momentum so that it gives the, the neighbors enough time to come and help. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's a mother's love, throwing yourself under a moving car. And then I read about a Kentucky mother. Uh, there was a hurricane of some sort or tornado. And because she had children in the house, she directly threw herself above her children. And the tornado ripped through the house. And portions of her flesh, like legs and stuff, limbs, were ripped apart. The child survived, but the mother sacrificed her life to save the child. The closest thing to God's love for mankind is a mother's love for their children. Now consider a mother that has, I come from a big family. In our family, there's uh, 13 of us, right? Now consider a mother that has 15 children, right? She loses one child. Can you console her by telling her that, okay, you still got 14 more children, you don't have to worry about this one? It doesn't work that way. That one matters, you get what I'm saying? And the love for that one can never be replaced. It's not going to be replaced by the fact that she has 14 others that are still alive. That one child matters. This is the closest thing that we can get to a comparison to the love that God has for mankind. But even if I use that as an illustration, the love that a mother has for their child falls short because the love that God has for his children is far much greater than I can explain. No words can adequately describe Jesus' love for us. And we are told in scripture that even a mother that loves his child can also abandon that child. I mean, I read in the news about a child that was found in the dustbin because it was just left there. But by God's grace, that child was still alive when they found that child. So even though a mother loves a child today, you can, I mean, God's love cannot be explained and it cannot even be complained, uh, compared, sorry. That's the love that God has for us, his children. So all I know is that he is not willing, he was not willing that the sin, uh, the disease of sin should rob him of any of his children. And if you were the only one that had gone astray, we're told in inspiration that Christ still would have came and died for you. You know, uh, we're reaching almost 8 billion people in the world today, right? We read about someone dying in the news, and what do we do? I mean, we just turn the page because, I mean, there's 8 billion people. People die every day, so what, right? But that is not the case with Christ. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground without his knowledge. That's how much he cares for his creation. So God had a plan to save all that had been affected and infected by sin, he put a plan in place in order to save us. Now, what is this plan? Turn to Leviticus 14. Leviticus 14. Leviticus 14, we're going to read verses one to seven. So I'm going to read 1 to 7 first, and then we'll come down and we'll break it down, okay? So Leviticus 14, are we all there? If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This shall be the law of the leper of the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. The priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and hyssop, and dip them 
and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water, and he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean. And let the living bird loose into the open field. Let's read verse 8 too. He who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and wash himself in water that he may be clean. Okay, so let's that break that down. What does this have to do with the plan that God has to save mankind? First of all, we have to understand that we all suffer from this disease called leprosy, the leprosy of sin, right? So what, does, what plan does God have in order to save us from this disease so that we do not self-destruct? Okay, let's break it down. So it says in verse 14, the Lord spoke to Moses, this shall be the law of the leper the day of the cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if, uh, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command uh, to take for him who is to be cleansed two living birds, okay? Keep that in mind, two living birds, right? And what else is he gonna take? Read it with me. Cedar wood, what else? Scarlet and hyssop, right? Right, okay. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. The bird was to be killed on a, over an earthen vessel over running water. Now, who do you think that bird represents? Hey, Christ, are you sure? How do we know that? <laughs> okay. That's a very good answer. It does represent Christ. So keep in mind there were two birds. One is killed over the earthen vessel over running water. Now if you turn to John, John 19 verse 34, you'll see something special that happened here. John 19 verse 34. Are you there? Okay, so it says that, you know, speaking to Christ on the cross, but one of the soldiers pierced his side. Actually, let's read from 32. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out, right? So when you go back to that bird that was slain, it was slain, there was a mixture of blood and water. When Jesus was pierced in the side, it was two copious streams. It wasn't water mixed with blood. There was a stream of water, there was a stream of blood. So when you go back to here and you see the bird that is killed over the earthen vessel, the same thing is happening here. You understand what is happening? Okay, let's read on. Okay, so two birds, right? One is killed over the water, and then what else? It says that he was to bring what? The cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. Okay, what's a cedar plant? You know the cedar plant is the, uh, sorry, the hyssop is the smallest of all plants, right? Now remember when we talked about the leprosy, we talked about how not only it infected man, but it also infected the entire environment. Everything that the leper touched, the air that he breathed, everything he came into contact with became infected. You get what I'm saying? So now we're looking here and he's talking about he has to bring hyssop and cedar wood. What does that have to do with this? Now, hyssop represents the smallest of the plants in the animal kingdom, right? And the cedar represents the giant of the forest. So two extremes from the smallest to the greatest embracing everything that's in between. Are you following me? You following me? So this is a represent representation of the entire uh, vegetation kingdom and it was supposed to be dipped in the blood of the dove that was killed over the running water. Does that make sense? So not only is this blood to cleanse the man, but it's also to cleanse everything that has come into contact with sin. Are you following me? Okay, now it goes on to say something very interesting. And it says cedar wood, it says hyssop, but it also mentions something that's very interesting. It says scarlet, right? Now when you think of scarlet, what do you think of? A what? Red. Yeah, you know, sometimes you think the color red or something, right? First thing that comes to mind. But I started to do a little research about what is this scarlet. And then I come to Hebrews 9.19, right? Turn to Hebrews 9.19. If you're there, say amen. amen. Hebrews 9.19, it says for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, right? 
So the same thing is being used here, but now it's saying it's scarlet wool. You get what I'm saying? So now when you look at the word scarlet in Hebrew, it's actually the word tolata. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that in Hebrew. And it mainly refers to the color that is gotten from the animal, but in some cases it represents the animal itself. That's what it says in Hebrew, right? So remember the leper, right, was infected by this disease. Everything he came into contact with was infected and sin, because of what Adam did, it not only affected man, it affected vegetation, it affected the whole animal kingdom. Because at some point, the lion could lay down with the lamp, with the lamp, right? The leopard with the kid, but that's not so after sin came into the picture. They're at war with each other constantly. You get what I'm saying? So now through the death of this bird, the blood of this bird, this animal, was supposed to touch, was supposed to be sprinkled on the man seven times, right, if you read further, to cleanse him from sin. But also the vegetation was to come into contact with the blood, right? And not only that, but the animal kingdom, the animal kingdom would also come into contact with the blood. You get what I'm saying? So the death of Christ on the cross not, was not only for mankind, but was to restore everything that had been lost as a result of sin. You understand what I'm saying? Are you following? Now, it's also interesting to note that there were two birds here. One of the birds died, and the other one that was dipped in the blood was to be set free, right? <laughs> So one died and one is set free, which represents the death of Christ and his resurrection. And by his resurrection, all things will be made new. You understand what I'm saying? You don't seem very excited about that. <laughs> you, you, you wanna continue in the way of the way things are going, right? Are we not happy that Christ did all this for us? <laughs> So now the bird was set free, and the blood of this, uh, that, that was on the bird, right, was carried through the air that was laden with the germs of the disease called sin, right? So only through the death and resurrection of Jesus do we have the promise of a new earth, an earth free from sin, pure and clean atmosphere, which, which all things will be made anew. It is only because of the death and resurrection of Christ. Right? Because of the death and resurrection of Christ, all vegetation is going to be restored to its Eden beauty, and it'll even have a, 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 a beauty that surpasses the Eden from times past. Because of the death of Christ, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And because of the death of Christ, we shall be free from sin. We shall have new bodies free from disease, free from the effects of sin, and we will declare, sin, where are your shackles? Death, where is your sting? That's only possible because of the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Because of the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus, we shall also declare with Job, I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last on the earth, and after this old body is destroyed, this I know that in my new glorious body I shall see God. Through his death and resurrection, we shall have new bodies. No more sickness, no more death. You know, uh, 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 the, the, the most joyous thing for a leper was for him to be cured from this flesh-eating disease, this degenerate disease that was tearing him apart. And because of sin, we witness a lot of sickness. We witness a lot of, you know, poor health, a lot of death and all these things. But because of the death and resurrection of Christ, we shall have new glorious bodies, bodies which even death itself cannot even touch. See, God's plan is simple. Turn to Luke 5. Turn to Luke 5. If you want to know what God's plan is, it is simple. If you haven't understood anything that I have said here today, just read Luke 5, verse 12 to 14, right? It says, and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. He fell on his face and implored him, said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And what was Jesus' response? The most beautiful response. So put, picture yourself there. That man with the leprosy, that's you and me. We're infected with sin, reaching out to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I can just picture his countenance looking very beautiful, very kind, with a smile on his face, reaching out to this man. And he says, I am willing to make you clean. Be clean. And that is the case for each and every single one of us today. So it doesn't matter how bad your infection is, 
right? You know, human doctors, when they get to a certain point, you're in stage four cancer and there's nothing that they can do for you. They will just tell you, you know, hospice or something like that. There's nothing more. We have done everything that we can. But that is not the case with Christ. It doesn't matter how far you have gone. It doesn't matter how bad your disease is, right? We have Jesus, the great physician, and he is willing to heal you if you can but reach out to him and say, Lord, and he is there smiling with his face, ready to, to, to take your hand in his hand and say, I am willing, be clean. So it doesn't matter what you've done in the, in the past. It doesn't matter what your struggle is. You're struggling with addiction. You're struggling with debt, with finances. You're struggling with alcohol. You're struggling with pornography. It doesn't matter what your struggle is. We've all been infected by this disease, but we have hope and confidence knowing that there is a cure for this disease. And that cure is Jesus Christ. And he's waiting. He's waiting for us to reach out to him because his hand is outstretched towards us and he wants to heal us, right? You see all that's happening in the world today, right? All the sin, sin is rampant. I mean, when you live in the cities, all you hear is sirens, ambulances and all. That is all a result of sin. And Jesus is waiting with tears in his eyes because he's willing to heal his children, but his children just won't reach out to him. But if we but reach out to him, there is healing. And some people feel like, you know, I have to wait. I have to make myself better first because I'm too much of a sinner before I can come to Christ. You're going to be waiting a very long time, right? Because you cannot cure yourself. The only person that can heal you is Christ. When the leper came to Christ, right, he came in his condition. He came with the infection of leprosy, right? When I come to Christ, I cannot even try and imagine that I can even try and make myself clean before I come to him because that's self-righteousness. I have to come to him acknowledging that there is nothing that I can do about this inf infection that has taken hold of me. But I have to come also acknowledging and understanding the only person that can heal me from this infection is Christ. So I just come the way that I am. And I say, Lord, heal me, and he stretches out his arm and he says, I am willing. So I don't know what your struggles are today. I don't know what it is that you're struggling with, but you know what it is. I know what my struggles are. And I love that text in Romans where it says, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. So there is more that Christ has done to bring healing to us. There is a whole lot more. So what Christ has done is more than what sin can do to keep us in a, a dilapidated, broken down situation or condition. What Christ is offering is a whole lot more. You get what I'm saying? So it is upon you, it is upon me to recognize what that struggle is, to recognize that we are sinners, we are lepers, but we also have to understand and recognize that Christ is the only one that can heal us. And when he stretches forth his hand to touch you, you're guaranteed that you will be healed. You'll be healed from your brokenness. You'll be healed from sin, because sin only brings guilt. It brings guilt, it brings misery, and all these things. You know, when you have the peace of Christ, you know, uh, I'm closing here, right? When you have the peace of Christ, I'll tell you a little bit. I mean, you've probably heard my testimony many, many times, but I keep telling it, right? Because how can I keep quiet? <laughs> how can I keep quiet after what Christ has done in my life, right? And there are people with similar testimonies, or maybe even worse than me, and they can testify of the goodness of God because they're here today, right? So I was in a dilapidated state. I was rotten, stinking. I was, you know, gangster, drug dealer, pimp, whatever you want to call me. I was all those things, right? And when I was in the world, I never had peace. There was no peace. I never knew what peace was. When I came to Christ, I experienced what true peace was. And I tell you, I never want to trade it for anything. I never want to trade it for anything. And Christ can give you peace. He can give you joy. You know, there's a difference between joy and fun. This world promises you fun, right? But fun is transient, it's just, it doesn't last. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're happy today, the next day, you know, you're, that's what they call it, bipolar, I guess, right? Yeah, but what Christ gives you, it doesn't matter what comes your way. It doesn't matter what life throws at you. If you have the joy of Christ in your heart, nothing can break that, right? Yeah, nothing can break that, and Christ wants to give that to us because he understands that we have been infected by sin. And he went to the cross. He never had to do what he did, right? But he was not willing to be separated from his children. He was not willing to endure eternity if you couldn't be there with him. You get what I'm saying? He didn't want eternity if you couldn't be there with him. So that's why he took the chance. He put everything on the line. 
And if he had fallen or if he had sinned once, all hope would have been lost, even for him. You get what I'm saying? But he was willing to take that chance just so he can save you and me. Right? And now he's extending that invitation. And he says, I know what your condition is. You can't lie to him. He knows you better than you know yourself. You can't lie to him. I know what your condition is. I know what you're struggling with. Right? I know what it's doing to you and my relation, your relationship with him. But Christ is saying, but if you but come to me, I can bring healing to you. If you come to me, I can touch you and cleanse you from this disease. So don't wait till tomorrow because we're not promised tomorrow. Anything can happen here today, right? You can walk out of here and get hit by a bus, God forbid, but anything can happen, right? Don't wait till tomorrow. It says now is the acceptable time of salvation. So if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart today, you have to make that commitment today. It is no guarantee that you will receive that conviction later, right? Because this might be the only chance. So now God is appealing to each and every single one of us that come to me as you are, and I'll bring healing to you, right? So my appeal to you today, brothers and sisters, is that you heed the voice of God and know that you have a healer who is waiting ever patiently for you to come to him, that you may receive healing, that he may restore all things that the way they were before sin came into the picture. He wants to be with you for all eternity. So now it's incumbent upon you to decide what you want to do because now the ball is in your court. Amen.